what we're dealing with here, glittering air, is a complete lack of respect for the law and smoking the reef. It's called the dust pump. We live in a society of laws. Dust pump? Yeah. No, that's not real. This thing a weed. Takes one solid weekend of training to get that bag. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Police Academy podcast. I'm your host, Terrence Herrick, the producer and creator of Police Academy, and uh, I'm excited to be back here with you today and with our guest. Uh, But first, I need to mention our first uh, sponsor. They've been with us since very close to the beginning. Audible, as a company, saw the value in marketing through podcasts from very early on, and they were wise to do so. Because if you're listening to a podcast, you care, especially one like this, you care about learning, about self-development, you're probably a lifelong learner. Um, And those are the kinds of people that are going to be interested and love a service like Audible, just like I do. I advertise for them because I use Audible. And if I go back and look at all of the titles that I've listened to, there's no way in that same period of time I ever would have sat down, I would have had the time to sit down and read all of those books. So it's been a huge value, a huge asset to me in my life since I subscribed, and I know it will be for you as well. If there's a really good book out there that you've been wanting to read for a while, go online, see if Audible has it. They probably do. The number that they used to put out was 180,000 different titles that they have on Audible. That's an old number, and it's it's got to be much, much larger than that now. If it's a, if it's a good, well-known book, it's probably on Audible. Uh, I'll recommend two today. They're both written by Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, On Killing and On Combat. Both really good books. They have some overlapping um, information, content, but they are... They're both worth a listen. Number one, to because I think it's interesting to understand and talk about the psychology of the human brain, how, how our minds uh, react to uh, certain situations, in this case, having to kill another human being, and the, it, the intricacies of an interaction, an incident like that. And number two, if you're in law enforcement and or the military and part of your job could potentially be to have to kill another human being, I think it's really important to understand what's going to happen, how to prepare for that and, and what, what happens after the fact so that if it does happen and when it does happen for some of you, no doubt, that you're prepared for that. So both great books, On Killing and On Combat by Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman. They're both on Audible. Uh, a great listen. They're longer books, but that's what Audible is. That's why Audible is so great. Even if it's a long title, you you listen to it in chunks, and you can knock out these long books um, a lot faster than you think. You can actually speed up the rate at which the book plays, so you can cover more content in a shorter period of time. I usually listen on like 1.25% speed, so it's just a little faster than normal. But it does, in the long run, make quite a bit of difference in in how long it takes to get through some of these longer books. Um, Guns of August comes to mind. I'm I'm looking that one up right now to see how long that was. That was 19 hours and 9 minutes. Another classic book. Really cool to see how World War I basically started and how arbitrary that whole situation was that cost the lives of so many people. Um, long book, but it's classic. It's worth listening to if you're interested in understanding a really huge part of our history as as human beings uh, on on this earth. That was a, a massive moment in our time, uh, in relatively modern history. So, another great book, long one, but Audible helps get through titles like that that you would most of us would never have time to sit down and actually read. So, go check it out. AudibleTrial.com forward slash police academy podcast um, it supports the show when you subscribe and by following that link you get one free episode or sorry one free book uh, for your first month 
And then you get uh, a book every month after that as part of your subscription. It's like 15 bucks a month. And lately, Audible has been doing these promotions. Every month, they create a list of free titles. I can't remember how many you get. It's like three, three or four titles that I can get for free off of a list that they provide for that month. Basically a promotion list. But so in a sense, I get, you know, four or five books for free every month. Well, as part of my subscription every month. And that's, that's pretty amazing for 15 bucks. You can't, there's no way you can buy that many books at a bookstore. That link one more time for those of you wise enough to take my advice is audibletrial.com forward slash police academy podcast. Thank you for supporting the show and making yourself a little bit smarter. Now, without further ado, the man who is here to help us all get a little bit smarter today is Rich Milliman, the CEO of Extra Duty Solutions. Extra Duty Solutions is a service that helps law enforcement agencies administer their extra duty or off-duty programs. Uh, we call them off duty programs, uh, the department I'm from. Um, now, before extra duty solutions, there, there weren't any services specifically helping law enforcement agencies with their extra duty slash off duty programs. In 2015, Rich realized there was an inefficiency in the way that these programs were being administered. So he started extra duty solutions with his colleague, Adam Bryan, and it has grown to the largest extra duty service company in the U.S., and is now active in over 60 departments across the country. And these services include handling client interaction, scheduling, client invoicing and collections, officer payment, feedback, all aspects of the extra duty program administration. Law enforcement agencies maintain control of all management decisions associated with their program. Extra duty solutions does the work and eliminates the financial risk. And we're doing this interview because I think it's a worthwhile topic for anyone uh, currently in or thinking about getting into law enforcement, um, working off duty is a is a big aspect of your career for for many in law enforcement, and um, there's a reason for that. There's a reason these programs exist. There are all kinds of benefits um, for both the department and the community, as well as the officers involved with these programs. However, there are some things that you need to watch out for and uh, risks to try to avoid. So uh, Rich is going to help us um, kind of sift through that and give some advice in uh, avoiding those pitfalls especially. Please give your warmest welcome to our guest today, Rich Milliman. Well, Rich, thank you uh, again, obviously, for coming on the show. Appreciate you uh, coming in to share your expertise uh, with the audience here. well, why don't we start with, if you could just kind of explain what an extra duty program is, because many of our listeners are either new or, or looking to get into law enforcement. And it's not something that is really uh, at the forefront of, you know, right. Uh, it's not on their radar yet. So uh, let's start with that. What is sure. an extra duty program? Sure. An extra duty program is essentially, um, or let me just say extra duty is essentially when a sworn officer is working in typically a security capacity on behalf of a private entity. So to bring that sort of to life a little bit more, if you go to a movie theater on Saturday night and you see a cruiser out right in front of the movie theater with an officer in it uh, just sitting there, or you see an officer in the lobby in uniform, um, uh, that typically is an officer working extra duty. So in that moment in time, that, that officer is not considered to be on duty, and the officer is uh, being paid by the movie theater. So the movie theater is, in that example, called the police department or the administrator of the third duty, of, of the um, extra duty program and said, hey, on Saturday night, can we get an officer? We'd like him to come here by 8 o'clock, leave at 2 a.m. Um, the, there is typically a set rate structure, uh, not always, so... Um, typically the department will say, yeah, the rates are this much. Uh, if you need a cruiser, it's this much. And then the officer works the detail, um, gets paid either directly by the movie theater sometimes or typically through their, um, their normal payroll, through their municipality, and then the movie theater gets invoiced. Um, you see, depending on where you are in the country, 
in the north, a lot of extra duty programs um, are focused on road jobs where there may be state or local ordinances that require um, a, a utility or a construction firm or a landscaper, anybody who's ripping up a road or closing down a lane of traffic to have um, some level of security there, uh, law enforcement in case something goes wrong, or to uh, direct traffic. But it's essentially where officers are working in a capacity like that and being paid by a, uh, a company or private concern. Right. And so this is, um, it kind of gets to one of the issues I always uh, saw with extra duty programs in that it's it's kind of this estuary between the private and public sector where you've got public servants who are working for uh, private sector companies many times and you know you're being paid by say that movie theater but you're in uniform and have your authority through um, you know this public entity whether it's the sheriff's department or police department and um, that, that kind of gets to some of the issues that come with these programs and and what officers um, what liabilities they can incur by do working these programs so uh, we'll definitely we definitely will talk about that here in a minute but first what led you to why did you start extra duty solutions uh, can you give us the, kind of the lead yeah. up to that yeah sure prior to to doing this and i have a partner in a business and he and i worked at a large financial services firm i was um in risk he was in security so we worked um together a lot of times on different various situations and we used to occasionally use um extra duty officers for a variety of security details anywhere from um in uh, um sort of walk or being with the ceo or sort of being stationed outside of a restaurant where the ceo was meeting with you know somebody high profile to um security for you know a massive christmas party or something like that um, when we left the, the, the financial services firm, we kind of realized it's a very inefficient market. And our initial um, intent in starting our company, which was 2015, was to help the corporations interact with the law enforcement agencies. So, for example, if you're the chief security officer at Walmart and you want officers in 300 Walmarts on Saturday night, you have to call 300 different police departments. So it's it's painful. So our initial intent was just call us and we'll call the 300 police departments and uh, we'll make it easy for you. And in, in doing that, 2015, we realized that the pain is also suffered on the law enforcement side where they're getting inundated in some cases with calls, questions. Um, you know, you might have a 100 sworn officer department and they have a lieutenant and a patrolman that does nothing but uh, kind of administer the extra duty program. And then on the municipality side, there's another person that does nothing but send out invoices and make collection calls. So it's very burdensome on the, on the department, we realized. And in speaking with chiefs, we confirmed that. So we decided uh, to shift our focus away from the corporations and on to the helping the law enforcement uh, agencies administer these programs. And in so doing, we decided also to exit the corporate side because we didn't want to have a conflict of interest where – we're administering a local law enforcement extra duty program, but at the same time, we're, um, we're acting on behalf of Walmart or in the best interest of Walmart. Mm-hmm. So we only focus on the, on, on, we only help the law enforcement side, but that's how we got into it and then how we transferred from um, our initial intent of helping corporations to helping uh, the law enforcement agencies uh, themselves. Makes sense. So, Given all of the painful aspects of implementing a program like this, uh, both on the, the the private side as well as the agencies that are providing officers, why do these programs exist? I mean, there's uh, obviously plenty of private security companies out there. So can you explain you know, who these programs benefit? Why are they using off-duty officers? Yeah, so there's benefits to the different stakeholders of these programs. So let's start with the customers, or they're sometimes called the vendors. The, in our example, the movie theater or um, you know utility that's doing road construction. Um, 
if you compare the, you know, say the movie theater, they can have an officer there, they can have an armed security guard, they can have an unarmed security guard, and different entities will prefer different um, uh, outlets in that regard. But a lot of them will prefer an actual officer. Um, you know, they know they're getting a trained individual who is familiar with the law, who knows how to de-escalate situations before resulting, before turning to force, who goes to the range uh, to um, under under law, um, so knows how to use a gun, who when he calls or she calls for backup, the backup shows up. And also it's, you know, p- people that may be troublemakers uh, in the theater see a actual police officer as opposed to some guy with a gun. Um, they're probably going to think twice before something goes off the rails. So there's a, a, a big benefit to the customers, if you will, of having an officer there. In some cases, like in, in road work, there's um, local ordinances that require an officer to be at a construction site because of the probability of an accident or uh, the probability of the utility company not properly uh, using the right proper signage and, and um, changing lanes correctly and so on uh, is high. And so they want somebody who's been trained in traffic control to physically be there to make sure things are being done the right way to potentially actually direct the traffic and so on um, so that the probability of a, a bad outcome is, is low. The, 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 also, the other benefit to not just customers but society in general is you're getting more officers in more places. So I was just on the phone with a um, a, uh, a, a chief out in Arizona who said they, they had a situation in which there was an armed robbery in progress that became alerted of um, through a phone call to dispatch. Dispatch realized that there was an officer working an extra duty detail right across the street at a chain restaurant, a quick service restaurant, and was able to notify that officer and have that officer leave their extra duty detail and come across the street and de-escalate the situation. Therefore, that officer arrived in a minute. And if there was if that officer was not at the quick service restaurant working the detail, it could have taken seven or eight minutes, and who knows what the outcome would have been before officers arrived at the scene of the crime. So, so you are getting more officers uh, out there and sort of at the ready. Um, the, the benefit uh, for the officers is it's a twofold, really. One is it's a, it's a nice source of supplemental income, and it's completely voluntary. So, you know, in any any department who has such a program, you're going to have a percentage of officers that just don't work uh, extra duty details at all, and a percentage that will work, um, you know, a fair amount because they're trying to get extra money for daycare or saving for college tuitions or so on. But in addition, it, it enables the officers and the community to interact in a... Um, non-law enforcement way a lot of times. You know, mm-hmm. if you're a law-abiding citizen, you re- you actually rarely see officers. You, you, it's, it's, it's rare that you get to interact with officers. You may see them mm-hmm. out on patrol, but you kind of don't interact with them any, that much. But if you're at some kind of a festival or a concert, a park event, or something like that, and there's officers working a detail, now you have an opportunity to actually interact in a a non-escalation way with an officer, so it's 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 good in a ter- in terms of um, community policing or community service as well. So there's there's kind of benefits you know around the horn on it. All right, um, and just out of my own curiosity here, uh, because I've I've never really understood why, cer- especially certain uh, organizations use private security um, versus off-duty officers. Do you know, generally speaking, what the what the price differential, what the cost uh, for the private entity is uh, between a standard private security uh, company or service versus using off duty officers? Is there a big price difference, or where do where do they fall on that? It yeah, it depends where you are in the country, uh, okay. and the variance is gigantic. But mm-hmm. in some places. There is a formidable price difference, and in some places there is no price difference. And um, the the ones that are used in private security, um, oftentimes it's um, they 
they are hesitant to have the visibility of an officer, and they want a plain clothes um, individual, perhaps without a gun, that can basically call the police if something goes wrong. Mm. But they they don't want to go so far as having um, a uniformed officer for for whatever reason. Um, and you have some too that um, uh, you know they they have a relationship with somebody who owns a security firm and you know feel kind of that's good enough. Um, but there's plenty of vendors or customers that we interact with that have graduated from utilizing a security firm to extra duty officers because there was an incident in which the um, security guard handled it in a bad way and caused a liability situation for the customer or didn't handle it at all or, you know, didn't get out of the car or, or whatnot. And therefore the customer said, well, you know, we should really be using professionals on, on, on this as opposed to uh, what we have been using. So, but it, so usually it's not price driven. I mean, sometimes it is. Um, it's usually something else that's driving towards either a, security guard or a, or a uniformed officer. Interesting. Um, yeah, the one example from my own personal experience that really comes to mind was a hospital that was in our jurisdiction that they had private security, and it, w- it was exactly what you basically said. They were there to call the police if something happened, um, which... Yeah, we, we had a hospital um, just out west that, um, again, you know, we, we don't work for the corporations. We only work for the municipalities, so... Mm. Um, it, this agency, we were administering their extra duty program, and they were uh, using uh, uniformed officers for security for for many years. And they got a new, uh, I guess, chief security officer at the hospital who wanted to cut costs and got rid of the officers and started using uh, private security. And um, there was a couple of bad outcomes, and about five months later, they were back to using officers again because they thought... There was, you know, some extra cost in graduating up to the officers, but the quality of the security and the, and the and the lowering of the liability for the hospital from a legal perspective outweighed the uh, cost increase. Right, and that that was, um, I guess, the the lack of insight that the particular hospital that I experienced with did not have. In that, sure, maybe per hour they're paying a little bit less for these private security guys, I'll, I'll leave the name of the company out because it's pretty well known. But um, if something were to happen where the hospital gets sued and they, in, in the, in the few years that I worked there, there were the count. I can't even remember how many times something happened where the hospital could have easily gotten sued because right. someone with mental health issues that we put there, for example, took off. And the the security guards, basically, per their policy, stood there and watched them leave. You know, right. so these these people right. are a danger to themselves. They're a danger to the public, and the hospital just basically lets them go and calls the police again. It's like, well, you know, if you had an actual police officer there, that's not going to yeah. happen, and and that's a huge liability that the the hospital was basically ignoring. And you know, I always said. This is going to continue apparently until something happens and they do lose, you know, probably tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in a lawsuit. And then they're going to change their minds pretty quick. But that's, you yeah, know, I guess yeah. that's their loss. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, I can give you, we could do the rest of this interview with just one example after another like that. Right. Um, so, they, and I'm not suggesting we do, but uh, the, you, you just really need to think through why am I getting either a security officer or a police officer working extra duty? Why, what is my goal in doing this? And is the um, cost difference or going to the actual police department as opposed to a, uh, you know, a plain clothes person without a gun or with a gun, but what achieves my goal, right? If I typically the goal is to reduce risk and, how am I best reducing risk, and where am I getting the most from my for my for my money? And a lot of times that that's not thought through, and you know, a knee jerk uh, decision is made based on cost or some other factor, and it's not as you're pointing out until afterwards that that 
calculus is, you know, mental calculus is undertaken. And by then, the bad outcome has already occurred. Mm -hmm. So what are the, you know, we're kind of talking about the benefits of these programs. Um, what are some of the negative aspects of an extra yeah, program? So, yeah, so, you know, one, they fall in a few buckets, but one negative aspect is the administrative burden. So I, I alluded to this earlier, but we come into a lot of agencies where the reason they're interested in talking to us about us administering the program is because of the administrative burden. Um, like I said, a typical 100 or 150 sworn officer department would be, uh, you know, they might have one sergeant or lieutenant that does nothing but take calls from customers, explain the rates, uh, find out when officers work, uh, make sure they're getting paid, and, and so on. Well, I just spoke to one department that has 1,500 officers in it, and they have a team of 10 people that do nothing but administer this their extra duty program, and those 10 people are a combination of sworn officers and civilians. So in there's a, a big administrative burden, plus you've got some number of sworn officers who are not out there. They're not, you know, in a sense, uh, doing police work. They're doing administrative work. And then typically that administrative burden is times two from what you see on the police side, because over in the municipality side in the finance department, you've got invoicing and collections going on, which is another administrative burden. Another issue with programs is uh, financing the program. So in in the better run programs, the officers are not collecting money on site at the end of the night from the, the customer or the vendor. Rather, the, the, the vendor is getting invoiced or they're, being, or they're prepaying for the officer, and then the officer is getting paid through the municipality or, or through some organized channel. Um, and in doing that, there's typically a float. So if I'm working for a, a Verizon road job um, uh, and I'm a sworn officer, I get paid at the end of my payroll period, which is, say, next week. Um, but Verizon may not pay that invoice for two months. So now the municipality is floating an interest-free loan to Verizon for two months. And while my one pro my one detail the, the the level of that float may be you know three hundred dollars in pay plus a couple of dollars in cruiser fees and so on. When you multiply that by the number of details and the number of officers out there working, a municipality can have a ton of money tied up in float. Mm -hmm. And related to that is the bad debts expense. So if a, a little landscaper needs an officer and the next week goes out of business or something like that. Uh, the municipality, the taxpayer dollars, has to come in and pay that, uh, for the detail. So there's a, a bad debts expense too. So there's so there's administrative uh, burden plus financial. Some, in addition to that, you have some departments where the extra duty program grew up, as I say, one inch at a time. In other words, they had no program, and then there was some demand from a local customer who wanted some extra duty help. They started doing that, then a second customer, and a third. And before you knew it, over years, there's, you know, a formidable extra duty program where there is, you know, a few million or even more dollars per year in the float and so on. In those programs, there needs to be rules and regulations around, um, how many hours can officers uh, work extra duty in a 24-hour period or in in a in a week? Um, how much time has to elapse between exiting on duty and starting extra duty, or vice versa? And sometimes those rules don't exist, and uh, it can be you know what I the term I use is seductive for certain officers who want to make a good amount of money, and they could be working kind of more than they should be working. Mm -hmm. And we've seen fatigue, you know, we've seen bad decision making as a result of overwork and so on. So unless the right checks and balances are, are put in place, um, you can have the bad outcomes as a result of overwork. And then another um, um, risk, I would say, is the insurance aspect to it. Insurance in general, that world um, tends to be a tippy little world where uh, you find out after the fact whether something's covered or not covered because mm -hmm. do you have the right insurance, do you have enough coverage, do you have the right writers. Um, you know, we've all been in a situation, especially with, like, say, health insurance, where 
you find out, oh, no, that's not covered, or, you know, because, and you were surprised about that. Um, but there is 58 pages of fine print that you didn't read. Um, it, it's no different in the extra duty world. Um, the municipality or the third party administrator, whomever's covering these officers and, and bad outcomes, needs to make sure that their insurance actually covers this stuff. And mm -hmm. that if something bad happens, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a workers' comp issue, it could be, simple, be something as simple as an officer uh, working a detail at a bank opens the door for um, uh, an elderly person to enter the lobby and accidentally hits somebody's face with the door, causes bodily harm, it's a liability issue. You need to make sure you're covered for things like that. Um, um, so, the, so those are the kind of the biggies of of the issues of the administrative burden, the financial risk, both in terms of float and credit risk, the uh, insurance and the guardrails around making sure that people aren't being overworked or have the opportunity to get too tired on the job. Mm -hmm. So what liabilities are, are officers specifically opening themselves up to, you know, say a, a newer officer, especially who hasn't done a program like this in the past, um, what kind of questions should they be asking when they're signing up for one of these spots? And what do they need to watch out for? Yeah, the, well, the first question I would ask, I always tell officers to ask, is why are you doing it to begin with? I mean, let, let's you know, put the insurance and the, the risk, of bodily harm risk and so on aside. Um, why are you working extra duty? Because you have a job, you're making money as an officer, so why are you getting more money? And that may sound like a silly question, because more money is better than less money. But at the end of the day, you know, if, if you're working extra duty details and you're working, say, 10 hours a week or 12 hours a week on these details, those are 10 or 12 hours a week that you're not doing something else. And as with anything in life, you should just, you know, sort of step back every once in a while and question, am I living the life I want to live? Am I, am I spending time the way I want to be spending time? Because we have seen situations where officers, and again, I'll use that word, get seduced into kind of easy money. And, you know, we've seen certain, we've gotten called into departments where the reason we got called in to administer the program and, and put in checks and balances that the municipality wants or the chief wants is because they had, you know, some officer who was making $72,000 a year and then an extra duty made another 140000 a year. So, like, how is that even possible? Mm -hmm. So you really need to question, you know, why am I doing this to begin with? Um, and, you know, is, is it really worth giving up all of my discretionary time or time with friends, time with family, time with my kids in order to make, you know, that extra dollar? But in addition to that, on the liability side, um, you know, number one, and it's not really the officer's responsibility, it's, it's, it's um, leadership responsibility and the municipality's responsibility to ensure that if there is an issue, like that example I gave where an officer is working a detail and accidentally um, causes bodily harm by opening a door into somebody's face, does the insurance, the municipality's insurance cover it? And in most times, most cases, you're perfectly safe, but not always. I've seen cases where the insurance is too narrow, there's not enough riders on it, uh, it doesn't cover uh, plain clothes, it doesn't cover outside of normal working hours. And, and there can be issues. The workers' comp is the same thing. If an officer is working a detail and gets injured um, as a result of, you know, and it doesn't have to be because they got into a fight with a criminal. They could be walking around a golf course and hit a, a divot and twist her ankle or something like that. Or they covered for things like that. And again, most of the times you're going to be fine. Uh, it's very clear who covers it. But I, we've seen examples where it's really murky, you know, and, and there's an argument between the customer and the municipality or whatnot of whose workers' comp is going to come into play here and, and so on. The one the one thing that we've seen, which is utterly shocking, uh, we had, and I'll give you a real-life case, we had a situation where there was a, a large warehouse uh, in the footprint of the municipality that we work for, and uh, an officer uh, went there to work a detail. It was the first time this officer worked at that particular detail, uh, and he called our account team the next day and said, hey, uh, that sheet of paper I had to sign at the warehouse last night, do you guys get a copy of that? And the account manager said, what are you talking about, a sheet of paper? So the account manager called the um, uh, security person at the warehouse and said, send me the sheet of paper you have an officer sign. And after some back and forth, um, she got it, and it was basically taking all the risk and shoving it onto the 
officer. So there was one way of identification there. There was, uh, you know, agree to hold harmless language and so on. And we ended up, I ended up calling the, uh, the um, legal counsel for the municipality and the police department itself and saying we got a problem here. And the, any officer, the outcome was any officer who had worked in that warehouse since they started making people sign papers um, was not allowed to work in the warehouse anymore because the risk was too great for the individual officers, it was determined. And then, of course, I and the chief spoke, and the lawyer spoke with the, uh, the security officer at the warehouse and said, don't ever try that again. And, you know, it's, and they ended up going through a security firm and pushing risk off on a security firm. And the security firm called us for the officers in that case. But that's, um, you, you know, the lesson that there is, you know, if you're going to sign something, make sure, make sure you know what you're signing. Mm-hmm. Um, because the, uh, the incentive or the interest of the what's best for the customer and what's best for the municipality can be two different things. So if you're an employee of the municipality, as all officers are, and you go to a customer, um, you know, use your judgment. We had one case where a, a, a jewelry store um, called for service, and we had never worked for this jewelry store in its footprint, footprint before. And the account manager said, all right, what would you like the officer to do? Why are, you, why are you requesting extra duty? And they said, well, we want the officer to get the master key, go into the back room every day at 10 a.m., count the Rolexes. And we said that yeah, we're going to talk to the chief about this one first. And our suggestion to the chief is don't ever, no way should you do this because liability to the municipality is outrageous in something like this. And he agreed. So there needs to be some level of, you know, what I would just call, call, call common sense or are you truly acting in the capacity of a police officer? Are you doing something that brings so much liability either to yourself or your municipality or agency that you shouldn't be doing this? Right. So if there's a department that is has a young or maybe not well-formed uh, program, what advice do you have for those in that situation? How do they how do they set up a good program that will protect their officers and hopefully help uh, that that municipality avoid ending up in the newspaper for the wrong reasons? Yeah, and that's a really good, uh, the way you put that is very good, ending up in the newspaper for the wrong reasons, because a lot of times when we get called in, it's because either that's already happened, right. or the chief recognizes, you know, it happens somewhere else in my state, and I don't want to be the next one. Um, so we actually, when we come in, we have a kind of a checklist that we, we go through to make sure that, as we start administering the program, that um, these risk points are taken care of, so that there is... Uh, a minimal amount of risk that's levied onto the the department or the municipality. But um, in setting up a program, the the areas that I um, that we tend to focus on are number one is um, the insurance, which we talked about. It's just doing, going through the checklist and making sure if this happens, how are we covered? If this happens, how are we covered? And it could be, you know, we we have a ton of insurance that we. Um, utilize to cover the officers and the municipalities. The municipality has insurance and the customer has insurance. And in many cases, we require the customers to uh, send over a COI, a certificate of insurance, and we verify that they have, you know, at least a million dollars of liability or something like that to protect the individual officers. So there is sort of check check boxes around the insurance. There's also um, internal questions of, and some of this I alluded to earlier, but how much are you going to allow officers to work in the extra duty capacity? Um, do you want to have guardrails around that? Does it make sense to have guardrails around um, time in between on duty and extra duty, either for a rest period to make sure somebody's not working 20 straight hours between the two, and or for you know travel time? If you're in a larger municipality and you're in say precinct number four, and you're working at the Waffle House, that's on the other side of town, it could take you a half an hour to travel over there. So no way should you be saying that you're leaving your active duty post at 5 and starting the extra duty post at Waffle House also at 5. Not possible. The other area where we really focus internally is how are you divvying up these jobs? So in smaller agencies or agents and or agencies where there's not a lot of extra duty, a lot of times there's just a sign-up sheet. Or in our case, we come in with technology and officers um, – 
can see via email or text what jobs are coming in, and they can sign up for them. And you can just do it first come, first serve, and that, and that works out fine. But when you have an agency where there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of um, details, typically having some type of what we call fairness algorithm and how these how these details are divvied up, either rotation list or point system, or there's millions of variations on these things, to make sure that the same six guys aren't getting all the, the details um, usually is, is important. Mm-hmm. And along with that, you want to have transparency and simplicity in your in the way you're divvying up these de- these details, we we ha- we've had some departments that have come to us. We've asked them to explain how do you how do you schedule your details? How do you divvy them up? And they couldn't answer the question because nobody really understands it. And and that of course leads to unfairness algorithm uh, unfair, unfairness um, claims or even up to union grievances um, mm-hmm. because uh, it's it, you know it's it's unknown how this is done. And 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 I always suggest having a, a great amount of transparency into the program. If I sign, if I'm a sworn officer and I sign up for a detail and I didn't get it, why not tell me who got it and why they got it? You know, either they're higher on the rotation list than I am, or they worked, they haven't worked in the last three months, and I worked four times in the last three months, or whatever the reason is. And that usually alleviates a lot of the headaches um, uh, with the program. And then finally, I would um, address. Um, the administrative burden and the financial risk. Like, how is this being taken care of? If, if, if is the city okay with floating all that money to, to the customers? Um, if, uh, how are the officers getting paid? Do you really want officers getting cash at the end of the night at the movie theater when everybody's walking around with a movie, with a with a with a movie camera on their iPhones these days, or do you want it sort of? Um, uh, in, in another way, where the, the money is coming into the municipality or to us, the third-party administrator, and therefore the taxation is done correctly and everything's sort of buttoned up, um, and also you know the, the guardrails around how much the officers are working and so on. So there's you want to sort of think through these things. It's like anything else in life. Before you sort of jump, you want to think, you know, is the water going to be deep enough, or am I about to die? And you want to um, just sort of think through these basic facets of programs where others have made mistakes and had bad outcomes to make sure you're not about to follow in that same footstep. Right. So, and it sounds like a lot of what you guys do is kind of that, that expert consultant role where you, you know, you know, you've experienced through working with all of these different departments, um, you know, what the best practices tend to be in this realm and you're, you're kind of, you're guiding these departments and these programs through that. Um, what other, aside from kind of basically providing your, your expertise and guidance, uh, what other solutions does extra duty solutions provide, uh, departments in creating and operating their ADPs? Yeah. So we, we provide what, you know, is typically called a managed service, um, approach to extra duty. So we administer the program. And, and by, by that, what I mean is, you know, uh, when customers are calling to find out what the rates are or to schedule officers or to move officers because it's raining today and I can't work outside today or whatever the issues are, they're calling our account team that we've assigned to that department. Mm. And we have, uh, you know, technology to make that easier. We have um, portals that re- recurring customers can log into and do things online where we have 24 seven account teams. So, you know, t- at night in the East coast between midnight and 8am, we typically have 50 or 60 emergency calls, which are all extra duty calls. Um, we, um, it, we, we find out what kind of a scheduling algorithm the department wants to use. And that's what we use to um, um, offer up the jobs to the um, officers or assign the jobs. And, the officers, they also get portals. They can go on on a computer or an iPhone or an Android phone, and they can see what jobs are available. They can sign up. They can check in and check out a job so we know when they actually work. Because a lot of jobs will it may be scheduled to end at 10 p.m., but it actually ends at 9 or 11. Because, you know, if it's a road job, a construction job, you really don't know. You're guessing at how long it's going to take, in a sense. Um, even the contractor is guessing. So, so they have a check-in and check-out capability. And then we pay the officers either directly, um, you know, direct deposit checks, or through the municipality, however they want to do it, 
um, at the end of every payroll period, which could be weekly or biweekly or you know whatever, whenever the municipality wants us to pay them. Mm-hmm. So there's no cash on site. There's no officers waiting three months for the utility company to pay their bills. Um, there's no you know three people doing the accounting on the payroll. Um, on the municipality side, we have a large finance team that handles this. In fact, in the last um, in the in the last um, week, we've paid somewhere between one and one point five million in payrolls, and that's a typical week for us. Hmm. And then the invoicing and collections—they're out of that business. Um, we invoice, we collect, um, and we do all that financial float. We finance that, and we take the risk of a bad debt. If some landscaper goes out of business the week after a detail, that's our problem. We've already paid the uh, the officer. So um, there's no more financial risk um, to the to the department or the, or the municipality. And like I said before, we have a bunch of insurances that along with what the, the insurance that the municipality has and or the customer has protects the situation. And our the cost of our service to the to the department is zero. We, we charge a small admin fee to the customer, the vendor, and that's how we get paid. But the savings in terms of administrative burden and the financial uh, risk going away and the cost of that float and uh, the cost of the people that are doing all this work, they can be reassigned to you know actual police work or other detail, other jobs. And we're taking on all that administrative burden, and it doesn't cost the department or the municipality anything. So it's a big savings for them. But as you point out early on, typically we come in and say, "How are you doing this right now?" Mm-hmm. And we can usually poke holes and you know uh, and come up with some suggestions of, "Hey, you know, I mean, in real life, I have a meeting uh, on Monday with a good-sized department, and we got their." Um, their ordinances on how they divvy up their jobs. And we met internally a couple of days ago in our uh, headquarters and said, all right, if this is how it's done, if I want to take advantage of this, uh, here's how I'll do it. You know, here's how I'll game the system. So we can usually come in and say, here's some suggestions on how you might shore up the way you're, admit- you're, you're divvying up the details so that there aren't kind of these loopholes where um, somebody can take advantage in an unfair way. So, I mean, for the department, it seems just listening to describe, you know, how, first of all, if the, the department is not losing anything in, in in the sense of fees to your company, it seems kind of like a no brainer. If, if you're taking on the administrative tasks and freeing up the officer or officers in those bigger departments that were doing that full time and taking on that financial liability and also helping the department reduce their liability in their off-duty programs. To me, it, uh, because a department should not be, it, they're not a private entity. They're not a business whose goal is to make more money, right? So if they say they lose a customer, this is a hypothetical, right? I'm not saying that they will. Say they lose a private customer that's that's using the department for off-duty. Um, and because a company like yours comes in and, uh, the the cost to that private entity goes up a little bit, and they say, "Well, we don't want to pay that," and they go to a private company. That doesn't hurt the department in any way. Yeah, and it, it, you're exactly right. And and in addition to that, we actually track that. Like when we come in, and the rate goes up a little bit because we're putting our fee on top. Um, um, how many customers do we lose? Right. And net, net, I don't think there's ever been a case where we've come in and the total number of hours has gone down. It usually stays flat. Like in the north, it'll typically stay flat because most extra duty is road jobs and it's dictated by ordinances and it's for utilities and contractors and it is what it is. If you're gonna if you're gonna close down a lane of traffic, you need X number of officers. And it really doesn't kind of matter if there's an extra three dollars on top of the you know the rate or something like that. In the South, where it's more security driven, and out West, it's more security driven. You know, we've seen a, a couple of situations where you know a, a restaurant pub would say to us when we first started, "Well, what do you mean we have to pay? We usually just give the officer's girlfriend free beer." Well, that's you know the IRS doesn't want to hear about this and. That, you know, we're shoring this thing up a little bit. So sorry, you can't do that anymore. Um, 
But we've never had a case where the total hours went down. A lot of times it goes up a little bit because it just becomes a lot easier um, for the customers. You know, we we have ninety four percent of our calls are answered by the end of ring two. 24 hours a day, 3 a.m. too. If somebody says, hey, can you put a PO number and an invoice, we put a PO number and an invoice. We have we have the infrastructure to do that easily. And as a result of it being kind of easier for the customers, even though there's an extra fee, uh, sometimes the total number of hours uh, goes up. But, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. You're not to not to do it. <laughs> right. Um, so if there, if someone's listening to this and they're an administrator or just even an officer who are they're sitting there going, Okay, this sounds like something that my department needs to do. Um, is there a way for them to to contact you guys and kind of feel it out before? Because we all know how government bureaucracies work. They're they're a pain in the ass, quite frankly, to yeah. to get anything done and to make changes specifically. Um, so, is there a way? And what does that look like as far as like, hey, an officer reaching out and saying, hey. Um, what could what could we do with my department? Uh, what is that? How how can they do that? Yeah, well, first on the um, on the, is there a way to test drive it? Um, you know, we get that question a lot. Hey, we don't want to enter into a a two year contract with you before we try it out because this is a you know there's a lot of people who are concerned about having a you guys come in here and administer the program. There's a lot of money at stake. We want to make sure there's not mistakes. So. Um, our general contract with the municipalities is month to month, forever. I mean, we we don't tie up the municipality or the or the agency in a two year or three year commitment or something like that. You could be working with us for one month or three years, and if you decide you don't like us or you don't want to do it anymore, you just fire us. The you know within thirty days we're gone. So it's it's it the whole thing is basically a test drive. We don't tie up the the. The municipality they shouldn't be forced to work with us or you know if there's a change in chief or something like that and the the new chief comes in and decides he wants to handle his extra duty some other way or terminate the program or or whatever he shouldn't be forced to work with us just because the guy before him signed a three-year commitment so it's always the whole thing is a test drive um but um as far as getting a hold of us um, our, our website is extra duty solutions.com so that's just one word www.extradutysolutions.com and we have um uh an email which is very simply info at info at extra duty solutions.com and that goes right to a, a team internally that decides is this a request for service or is this a a sales inquiry or, you know, some, um, um, uh, a request for some advice or something like that. And it gets routed to the right, uh, right people. So we are you know, usually within 24 hours, we get back to you and we set up a call or a meeting and, and go from there. Perfect. And I'll make sure that we get those in the show notes for any of you listening, uh, who are interested in, in exploring this option for your department. Um, I mean, part of why, well, the reason we had Rich on the show today is that, number one, it's it's an important aspect of a lot of officers' careers. Um, you know, some some of the officers, when they ask that question, why am I working out duty? It's because they they need to make some more money. They're supporting their family. Uh, maybe their wife lost a job or whatever it is. And it, it really does matter to them on the financial side. Um, but also just to, to help officers reduce... Um, that risk. So if, if you're, if you're sitting here listening and it sounds like something you're interested in, we'll put those links uh, in the show notes. Uh, absolutely. So that you, you don't worry about writing them down if you're driving or whatever, they'll be there. Uh, whenever you get where you're going, uh, you can reach out to extra duty solutions, uh, when you have time to do so. And, um, at that, I think we've, we've covered everything that I wanted to cover today. So Rich, thank you so much for coming on the show for your time. Um, obviously, you're a busy man with a, a successful company uh, running and helping the law enforcement community in the ways that you are. So we really appreciate you coming on the show. It's, it's been my pleasure. It's been really nice talking with you. Thank you for having me. All right, that's a wrap for this one, ladies and gents. Rich, thank you again for coming on the show. If you want to reach out to Rich, um, you can do so 
at those links that we just talked about. ExtraDutySolutions.com is the website. Info at ExtraDutySolutions.com is their email. If you have questions, comments, concerns, gripes, bunched up, britches, or complaints, as usual, you can email Rich instead of me because I don't want to hear about them. No, I'm kidding. You can email us at policeacademypodcast at gmail.com. Um, as you know, if you've been listening to the show for any you know length of time, the listeners drive what content comes onto this show. And I personally, and I know many of you as well, would love to hear some more stories from the law enforcement community. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm not the greatest storyteller, and I have trouble remembering uh, stories until something in conversation usually reminds me of something that I experienced as well, and then I then the story comes back to me. But I'm not great at just remembering all the things that I've seen uh, in my time on the street. So I need your help as my audience, and many of you are, are veterans in law enforcement. Uh, please send me your stories. If you have something that you think uh, would be entertaining, especially uh, funny stories, interesting stories, dark stories, whatever it is, this show is about sharing the truth about what law enforcement really is. So uh, write me an email. You don't have to share the story in an email. You can write an email and just say, hey, I've got some really funny stories. Uh, if you like st- telling stories and you, you are a good storyteller, please, if you're a terrible storyteller, don't write me an email. Uh, but you know, if most a lot of officers who've been on for very long are used to telling their stories because everyone's always asking, tell me a good cop story. Please write in, let me know. We'd love to have you on the show. The audience is always asking for more cop stories. And uh, we will make that happen easy peasy, no problem. Police Academy Podcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to check out Audible at audibletrial.com forward slash Police Academy Podcast. It will make you less dumb if you're dumb, and it'll make you smarter if you're already smart. It is uh, a great self development tool, um, something that I use on a regular basis and I promote because it has changed my life, and I know it will for you too if you simply make that decision, make that commitment. And really, you know, when I was talking to Rich, Extra Duty Solutions sounds like a great opportunity, kind of a no-brainer um, avenue to at least explore because there's really no cost uh, for the department and there's lots of benefits on their end. And Audible is the same way. There is no cost up front. It's, you go to audibletrial.com slash Police Academy Podcast, and you get your first book for free. If you choose not to continue your subscription, just cancel it. You can sign up today, get your book, and then cancel it tomorrow, and you still have one free audiobook that you can try out, and then decide for yourself if you want to continue um, you know, receiving audiobooks and continue that subscription. It's 15 bucks a month. That's um, less or about the same as what it, it costs to buy an actual physical book. And like I said, Audible is always doing these promotions where you get uh, either discounts or, or in this case recently, every month they've been putting out free books. So for 15 bucks a month, I'll get three or four, five books a month. And that's a, that's a killer deal. So go check them out. Audibletrial.com forward slash police academy podcast. And uh, I promise you won't be disappointed. We have, uh, and I don't know if I should even mention this, but we have uh, another sponsor, potential sponsor, uh, that we're trying to work out the details with. And uh, just stay tuned for that because I'm, I'm really excited to share their products with you. I um, I reached out to them because I, I purchased their product and I love it. And it's something that I know that many of you listening would would really be interested in and benefit from and it will help protect you and your family so um, I'm really excited to share that with you I can't yet because we haven't worked out all the details but hopefully that will be coming soon Um, other than that hopefully everyone is doing well Uh, I'd love to hear from you if if you listen to the show for a while or you're new to the show just reach out I I enjoy interacting with the audience Um, shoot me an email We'd love to hear from you. Police Academy Podcast at gmail.com. 
And don't forget to share this show with your friends, family, and loved ones, because you are the reason why this show still exists, why we continue to, to produce shows and do these interviews, um, because it continues to grow, which tells me it's, it matters to people, because it only grows because you are sharing it, and uh, because of the feedback that I get from, from those listening, and uh, you sharing how it has impacted your life. That's why this show still exists. So uh, continue to do that if you have been, and I would encourage you if you haven't uh, shared the show, if you're not active in supporting the show in that way, to do so. We appreciate it so much here at Police Academy. We love you all. We'll see you next time. As always, do good, be strong, fear nothing.